Chapter 5, Living Proof. When Dr. Elliot returned a few hours later, he was accompanied by a woman who was apparently not a nurse. At least she wasn't in uniform. The doctor closed the door behind him. Then he pulled up two chairs, and they both sat down next to the bed. Ken, he said to the patient, I want you to meet my wife, Karen. She works with me on cases like yours. You are a nurse then? Ken liked her immediately. She exuded the same warmth and the same quiet confidence as Elliot, and her smile was contagious. I'm an RN, long retired, she responded, but I don't get involved with Hal's medical work anymore, only special cases like yours. Ken looked from one to the other questioningly. Then he glanced at his aching body. It looks pretty medical to me. It's a whole lot more than medical, Ken, declared Elliot. Medically, well, you should be dead. God had his hand on you, that's for sure. Otherwise, you wouldn't have survived. Look, Doc, with all due respect, as I already said, I'd rather you keep God out of this. You sound a lot like your fiancé. Carla, you met her? Once briefly, said Hal. I've been asking the nurses where she is. She's been in and out several times, but you are still in a coma. They've been trying all day to reach her to let her know you're conscious. Just got her a few minutes ago. She's on her way over. It'll be great to see her. We're getting married next month, announced Ken proudly. Congratulations, said Karen. Now look, said Ken, turning to Elliot, you seem to know some stuff that you shouldn't have, and you said my psychic research landed me in here. Dr. Elliot nodded. He leaned over from where he was, sitting beside the bed, and put his hand gently on Ken's shoulder. This isn't going to be easy for either of us, but you have to know. Seeing the apprehension in Ken's eyes, Elliot hastened to add, It has nothing to do with your prognosis. Ken looked immediately relieved, and Elliot continued, The duty nurse called me last night. You were in a coma, yet you were emitting strange voices, and you were writhing on the bed. Karen and I and several nurses all witnessed it. He paused. So what was going on, asked Ken. There's no easy way to tell you this, said Elliot solemnly. So I'll just be blunt. You were demon-possessed. Ken was indignant. Come on, I don't even believe in demons. You don't have to believe in cholera for it to kill you, put in Karen quickly. You're mixing metaphors, retorted Ken. You can identify cholera germs. You can also identify demons, countered Hal. There isn't time to beat around the bush. Human beings don't have psychic power. It's demonic, and your involvement in it nearly got you killed. Wait a minute, protested Ken. I bow to your expertise in medicine, but I resent it when you try to straighten me out on psychic research as well. Isn't this a little out of your field? Not at all, returned Hal quickly. I grew up in Ceylon and spent much of my life in Africa. I've done a lot of psychic research both overseas and in America, and I can tell you there's no difference between what Western parapsychologists are trying to reproduce scientifically in their laboratories and what's been going on in the third world in dark seance rooms and primitive jungle huts for thousands of years. That doesn't prove demons are behind it, said Ken firmly. We've proved it many times, interjected Karen. In every case, when we cast out the demons, the so-called psychic powers ended, and we faced witch doctors with powers that would dazzle Western parapsychologists. That would scare them to death, added Elliot. It's not demons you're casting out, said Ken. It's just that your brand of dogmatic fundamentalism is so negative that it destroys the positive atmosphere needed for psychic power to manifest itself. That doesn't speak too well for psychics, then, does it? quipped Karen. If false suggestions from dogmatic fundamentalists can strip them of their powers? A faint smile on Ken's lips acknowledged that the point was well made. You said I was possessed with demons, and you knew I tried to make contact with extraterrestrials. We have a prayer meeting in our home, began Elliot, and you were our main focus last night for several hours. So you prayed, Ken interrupted impatiently. I woke up from the coma, and you call it a miracle, 
and throw in the demons as a bonus? Is that it? Not quite, said Elliot. The charge nurse called me in the middle of our prayer meeting, told me about the voices coming out of you, and that you were moving while in a coma. Karen and I came right over while about 30 people in her home kept praying for you. When we got here, the voices claimed you belonged to them. They were in the process of destroying you. They, asked Ken apprehensively, who are they? They call themselves the Nine. The Nine? The color drained from Ken's face. He closed his eyes and winced with pain as memories surfaced, unbidden and horrible. Elliot waited patiently. Finally, Ken said weakly, Go ahead, I I'm listening. You wondered how I knew you tried to contact highly evolved extraterrestrials, continued Elliot. When we commanded the Nine, in the name of Jesus Christ, to tell us how they had taken possession of you, they confessed they pretended to be ETIs and said you'd fallen for it. They really said that? He looked stricken, like someone who had just been robbed and was watching a fire consume his house and all of his possessions. Dr. Elliot nodded soberly. It's the perfect scam that the whole scientific community is being set up to fall for. Maybe your experience will serve as a warning. It's not a scam, said Ken. It makes good sense. Just imagine what it could mean if such entities could share their incredible technology and psychic secrets with us. Every human problem could be solved. And you made contact, asked Elliot politely. I think so, but it's vague. Something went wrong, and I, I tried to fight them off. I have a hazy recollection that Frank couldn't understand and was upset with me. That must be why I left the lab. It felt like they were trying to take over my mind. They did take over and tried to kill you. Eyewitnesses reported that your driving was insane. Ken shuddered. I wish I could remember what happened. He lay there in silence, looking from Hal to Karen helplessly. Their name, he asked about that. How did you come up with that? You know, of course, that the nine are widely known in occult circles. Ken nodded. It's an identity demons often assume, continued Elliot. The nine are even mentioned in the Bible. But we didn't assume that was who they were. In the name of Jesus Christ, I commanded the seducing spirits that possessed you to identify themselves. And they said, we're the nine, just like that? Dr. Elliot shook his head. They screamed obscenities and threats to kill you and us. Karen and I have been through this many times before. The group was praying, and we didn't back down. Hal paused for a moment. Ken was listening intently. Your case was unique, he continued, and that's why it offers the kind of proof you want. Remember, you were in a coma, vital signs very weak, yet the veins were standing out on your neck, and loud voices, not your own, were speaking through you. It just happens that every bit of it was recorded by a TV camera over your bed in the ICU. When you're stronger, we'll put it on your TV for you, if you want to see it. Ken was stunned. You're not kidding me. You really have that video? Absolutely. I've got to see it. You will. It's all there. The sneering voices, the unbelievable contortions your body was going through while you were comatose. Not the least of it were the expressions your face took on. It was beyond description. That could have been purely psychological phenomenon, suggested Ken, groping for another explanation. The voices represented splits of my deep psyche, and the thrashing around was an unconscious release of psychic energy. Give that a little more thought, Ken, said Elliot firmly, and you'll realize it's absurd. Why doesn't your subconscious and everyone else's do that sort of thing all the time? The fact is, when the last demon came out, your coma ended that fast. Elliot snapped his fingers. You're going to heal so rapidly now that it will boggle the entire hospital staff. You'll be written up in medical journals, and the skeptics still won't believe it. Ken was shaking his head. I've got to see it before I'll believe it. You will, but you need some rest now. Ken looked tired, but he desperately wanted to understand. You don't like my theory about the unconscious or splits of the psyche, but don't you think it's a little bit archaic to talk about demons? 
is love archaic, asked Karen, or justice, or beauty, or truth? Some things never change, and good and evil, God and Satan, angels and demons are in that category. I could give you lots of reasons for calling them demons, added Hal, but you desperately need to sleep. For one thing, they admit that's who they are, and they cry out in rage, then fear, when confronted with the authority of Jesus Christ. Then they grudgingly obey. You'll see it all for yourself, then you can decide. Dr. Elliot and his wife stood up to leave. We've stayed too long. You get some sleep. Yeah, I will, sighed Ken wearily. Hal patted him affectionately on the arm. We'll be back tonight with that video. Ken's eyelids drooped and closed as he fought to stay awake to ponder the shattering pronouncements of these two obviously intelligent and sincere people. He would have dismissed them as fundamentalist fanatics had he not been in that hospital bed. That fact gave unwelcome credence to what they said. And the video, I can't believe it. There's got to be another explanation. But what if they're right? What if they're right? That unwelcome possibility hounded him to the very edge of unconsciousness. ¶¶